So a couple weeks ago, we started a new series entitled Remain in Me. And it's been a powerful series so far. The first week, we talked about joy-filled living. We talked about how God gave us a strategy for discipleship, meaning our spiritual transformation, our growth process. He wants us, at the end of the day, to be fruitful. He wants people to see the fruit of his spirit flowing through our lives. And the byproduct is not only that we make Jesus famous, but it's also that we ourselves experience that overflowing of joy in our own lives when we learn to remain in him. And uh, Misty and I are quite humbled, really, uh, at the power and the impact that this message has already had. Of course, that message was two weeks ago. And just one little teeny byproduct of that message led to the, uh, the girls Sooners winning the, uh, <laughs> the championship. And so we just want to show you a little clip. After, after all the girls seeing the message two weeks ago, this was the, this was the result. Pretty incredible. I'll start with ESPN. For, for the players, I know you talked about keeping the joy of the game, but I'm curious. It's a long season, right? And you guys have had the target on your back the entire time, the win streak being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that could very easily set in? Well, the only way that you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances and outcomes, and um, I think Coach has said this before, but joy from the Lord is really the only thing that can keep you motivated, um, uh, just in a good mindset, uh, no matter the outcomes. Thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, uh, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, and all of that. So uh, I would, that's really the only, the only answer to that because there's no other way that softball can bring you that um, because of how much failure comes in it and just how much of a roller coaster the game can be. 1,000% agree with Grace Lyons. Um, I went through that my freshman year. I I was so happy to win the college. I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't have. I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled, and I had to find Christ in that. And I think that is what makes our team so strong is that we're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world if we do lose. Yes, obviously we've worked our butts off to be here and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where, like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and, and our love for each other and our love for the game, because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for, and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really like shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, and I think that's just what brings me so much joy. And no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home, and I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And, yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home, and um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So. Oh, man, don't you love it? Don't you love it? I love that these girls get it. We were, uh, we were in, in Nashville with our girls this last week, and when that interview went out, our phones started blowing up by church members saying, did you see what God did through these girls? You know, just as a side note, you know, when, when you are willing, when you're a willing vessel to be used by God, if he can trust you 
and you can be obedient in the calling and the platform he's given you. Look at what God can do through you. If these girls hadn't have been willing, right? But to think about how God has given each and every one of us. He's given you a platform. He's given me a platform. The question is, can he trust you with the platform he's given you to make Jesus famous? That's the question. And they get it. They, the only way they were able to do that is because they have grown in their relationship with God. And God wants to grow you, and he wants to grow me. The question is, do you want to grow in him? And that's what this series is all about. As we learn to remain in Christ and he remains in us, we begin to grow. We begin to bear good fruit. And the result is people take notice, and then our lives are overflowing with the joy that only comes from the Lord. It's not in, it's not in any sort of worldly success. The real win was not the World Series championship. The real win is that they were obedient to Christ through the the winning of that championship to make Jesus famous, and they spread the love of God through this, and people now know, more people know about Jesus because of their obedience. That's the real win. That's the real win. So today, we're going to talk about this. This is the title of today's message, God Wants to Grow You. All right, so we're going to go back to John chapter 15. If you have your Bibles or you version, you want to pull it out this morning. But I want to just kind of remind you of the context of this passage. So this is the night before Jesus is going to die. He's just had the Lord's Supper, basically. He's had that Passover meal with his disciples. And now they're all just basically headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane, having a conversation. And Jesus is trying to lay out for them his discipleship strategy. Now hear me out. Any good leader has a strategy for what they want the outcome of a situation to look like. That coach said nothing, but I have so much respect for that coach because the reason those girls said what they did has everything to do with the influence of the leader who was leading that pack. I know just by watching that, that this was a leader who is in a university for heaven's sakes. And she's like, I don't care. I don't even know her, but I want to meet her because she obviously has led those girls to put Jesus first in everything. And so just like Brad said, we have a platform, but Jesus that night was trying to help his disciples to understand, I'm about to leave and I'm about to pass the baton to you. And when I do, I want you to understand that discipleship is what it's all about, but there's a strategy behind it. So think about that as I read John chapter 15 verses one through four. Here we go. I am the true vine. This is Jesus talking. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener or the vine dresser. Verse two, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message or the words of Jesus that he said that I've given you. Verse four, remain in me. Say remain. And I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot produce fruit unless you remain in me. So let's go back and kind of look at this metaphor. Listen, Jesus loved storytelling. He loved using metaphors, but this was one they fully understood because vineyards were all over Israel. I don't have a vineyard in my backyard. You probably don't either. And we don't live in Napa Valley. So I kind of want to help you to get this picture in your head as we teach this out. Okay. So you've got just basically, this is um, a grape vine that you see here. Jesus is saying, I'm the vine. I'm the one that's the root system coming up. You as a believer, you are the branch and it's the Holy Spirit working through you that's producing the fruit. Who's producing the fruit? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. Oh, you don't have to do it? Because I've been trying real hard for a long time to have self-control and I've been failing at it. You know why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that produces that fruit through your life. All right? But God is the vine dresser. He's the gardener and he's so good at his job. We see that laid out in verse two. So today we're going to give you two things. That is Jesus' discipleship strategy. We see them both in verse two in this short little verse, and it reads like this. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. We'll just stop right there. When you see the words cut off, that is one translation, but when you go back to the original language and you begin to study the context of the vineyards in ancient Israel, you begin to realize 
that the original word ario had other meanings. It meant this, to lift up, to take away, which is where they get cut off, or to raise. But really, many theologians believe that a better interpretation would have been to lift up. And I want to help you to understand why. And here's why. So um, we're going to move a little quick, but um, this is really interesting if you'll get into this. Is we, you know, obviously, we're not vine dressers, but we've learned a lot through studying uh, this series. Uh, the, the first order of business that a, a vine dresser will take upon himself when he's tending to that vine is he will look at the branches and the direction in which those branches are growing. A lot of times those branches will just naturally kind of gravitate towards the ground. And, and the branches growing on the ground is not a good thing at all. There, there's two main reasons. Number one reason is that foliage, when it lays on top of the ground, there's, there's dew, a lot of dew in Israel and a lot of moisture. And that moisture can get trapped under all the leaves and under all the foliage. And when that happens, then fungus can grow. And, and not only that, but then also there's four different types of invading insects that come and can eat at those leaves and those branches when they're lying on the ground like that. So the vine dresser makes it his top priority to begin to reposition or lift up those branches as quickly as he can. And he does that by putting a rock under the branch. Now, it might be a small rock to begin with, but as that branch begins to grow, he'll get either a larger rock or more rocks, and he'll start to make a mound because he wants to kind of redirect the, 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 the direction in which those branches are growing. He wants to get them off the ground, wants to get them up in the air so that they can literally thrive and begin to be in that position that they need to be in to begin to bear fruit. It's really no different with you and I. We've seen it all through the Word of God. We can give a, a lot of examples. We see God do it with, with Abraham. He ch changes his name from Abram to Abraham, changes Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. Look at Joseph, how he took him, and, and he ends up in this pit. He repositioned Joseph, put him in a pit, but then where did he end up? Because of that repositioning, he ended up in the palace. And through that, he became second in command over all of Egypt and was able to save his entire family. Family and continue the lineage that eventually led towards Jesus being born in that lineage. So, so don't ever take for granted or give pushback when God is trying to reposition you. God will do this in so many different ways. Typically, it's, it has to do with people, places, and things, right? People, places, and things make a huge difference and a huge impact in our lives. Think about the, 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 the impact that people, places, and things can have in your life. Think about it. You know, uh, we, we knew this, this couple earlier in our church plant, and... Um, I won't mention any names, but he was having some real serious struggles with alcohol and drug addiction. And, and one day, God, you know, his wife had been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying over him every single day, believing that God was going to just miraculously heal him. And lo and behold, he did. He came home from work one day, and he just confessed everything and quit cold turkey, alcohol, and drugs, and said, we're moving. And God laid that on his heart. They literally got all their stuff. They sold their house, and they moved. God repositioned them. And to this day, they are living for God. Their family's living for God. Isn't that awesome? And that's what God can do when we allow him to reposition us. Now, it may not be, you know, that drastic. It was for me. I was living in Jeff City. God called me to go to college. He said, I want you to move to Joplin. So he literally repositioned me to Joplin. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have met her. She wouldn't have met the man of her dreams. We wouldn't have planted this church. And, 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 and who knows how many countless people whose lives have been impacted for the glory of Jesus Christ because, because of obedience when we allow God to reposition us, he positions us to be able to grow and produce fruit. And as a result, people's lives are impacted and changed for the glory of God. And we learn to live with that overflowing joy that this passage talks about. So the first thing we see then as part of Jesus' strategy for our growth and our discipleship is repositioning. If we're not producing fruit, then God repositions us so that we can begin to produce fruit. Then the rest of that verse goes on to say that if we are producing fruit, right, we're already producing, then he prunes us so we can produce even more. Now listen, when I was growing up, my mom is an amazing gardener. I am not. I do not have a green thumb. Don't even know what that means, okay? I kill every plant that has ever been near me, but I kept my kids alive, so I feel like I have success in life. So, 
My mom, on the other hand, she was amazing, like still is. We had like this jungle in our living room growing up. I'm like, get this stuff out of here. But she would take something that was nearly dead and she would just tend to it and water it properly and, and lift it up and do all this crazy stuff. And those things, we had vines all over the curtains back in the day. It was crazy. But there were times when she would go in with scissors or if it was a bigger bush with those, what are those things called? It's bushwhackers. Bushwhackers. Yep. That's, that's, that's what they're the called. technical term. You just ask me what it's called. I'll tell you. Bushwhacker. There we go. <laughs> but she would begin to cut back branches. And I remember thinking, this is so ugly. Like, why are you doing that? It looks good to me. Like, why are you cutting them back? And she would explain the technical reason why. But in that moment, it wasn't pretty, guys. Okay? The pruning process is not pretty. It's not fun. Here's what it's all about. It's all about growth. Say that, growth. That's what God wants in your life. And that's what he wants in my life. He wants us to produce even more fruit. What kind of fruit are we talking about? Like if you're new to this whole Jesus movement kind of thing, you might be like, what are you talking about? Well, let me take you over real quick. Galatians chapter five, the apostle Paul lays out what is called the fruit of the spirit, okay? These are nine attributes that should be seen in the life of a believer. All right, here they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness and self-control. Now, how many of you by a show of hands would just say, I have mastered them all? No, my hand is really not up actually. No, because we are all a work in progress. Even as we begin to grow in our walk with Jesus, we start realizing, like I remember being a young believer and reading over this verse many times in my life and thinking, man, I am failing. Like I'm trying to have patience and I'm blowing it. Like I'm trying to love the unlovable, but they're annoying. You know, and I can just go down all the list. But then what I begin to realize is this is a natural process as God does his work in our life and we simply submit. Okay. So the pruning guys, most of the time comes in the way of trials, not fun. I could stand here and I could go through a list in my own life and Brad's life and our kids' lives and times when we had to just sit in the chair and by faith believe that God was going to move. And it was in those trials that we grew more in that stint of time than we ever have in our life. Our faith grew, our endurance grew as we faced difficult situations in our marriage, when we faced hardships with our finances, when we faced those times when we were believing by healing for a loved one, when we were in those moments where we were hard pressed, guess what we did? We ran to Jesus, we ran to Jesus. Guys, so many times when life is going good, we're not running to Jesus. We're just running. Like things are great. Like we're just having a good time in life. But then the trial comes. The clippers come out. And it's not pretty. Somebody may see you ugly cry. Somebody may see you having a rough day. It's in those trials, if you'll run to Jesus, that you'll begin to see growth in your faith. I don't know how many of you enjoy lifting weights, but our family are gym rats and we love being in the gym. And I love the process of weightlifting because your muscles, there's a process that God created for your body and it works in our spirit too. And it's this, when you go to the gym and you lift weights, you put your muscles under pressure, all right, under tension, but it doesn't actually grow right then. That's why you can't go and work the same body part out every single day in a row to exhaustion. You actually don't grow that way. Growth of the muscle happens when you rest, because the muscle fibers tear when you're lifting heavy weights, but they heal as you let them rest and they expand. Listen, God's gonna allow you to be in some pressure situations. He's gonna allow you to go through some tough moments, some trials in your life. He's gonna use those circumstances to grow you, but it's only gonna be in the rest period. What does that mean? It means when you'll rest in him, when you'll remain in his presence. You see, the last verse says, remain in me and I in you. Because a fruit cannot, let me just read it. I'm gonna mess it up. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Guys, the process that God wanted for each of us is that we would learn to just be one 
with Jesus. When you're facing those moments of pruning, when you're facing those moments of repositioning, basically it's all very uncomfortable. It's tough. But God is constantly pushing us just enough, not so that we break, but he's stretching us just enough so that we lean on him, we run to his word, we see what his word has to say about our situation. We gain strength through his word. We begin to see the character of God through his word. And all of a sudden, naturally, the more time you spend with Jesus, you start to look like Jesus. The more time you spend in his word, the more your thoughts begin to reflect that of Jesus. The more time you spend with worship, you begin to realize that when things get really stressful, you turn on a little bit of worship and you notice the atmosphere changes because it's called growth. It's a natural process, guys, if we just remain in him. So how might God be trying to reposition you right now? How might he be trying to prune you right now? And are you, are you, are you sensitive to that? Are you looking for it? Are you anticipating it? Are you embracing it? Or are you giving God pushback? No, God, it's uncomfortable. I don't like, I don't like where I'm headed. I don't like what you're doing in me right now. God, this, this isn't my comfort zone. You're taking me outside of my comfort zone. But, are you, but do you realize what God is really trying to do? You know, it doesn't have to be you up and moving to another town. In some cases, that, that might literally be what God has to do with you to reposition you. But it might just be that he wants to reposition your relationships. Maybe he wants to reposition those that you've allowed into that inner circle, those who have the greatest amount of influence in your life. Maybe, maybe they're not really pushing you towards Christ. And maybe he's saying, I want to reposition your friendship. I want to put you around some other people. That's why we push life groups so hard. It's why we push volunteering in the church. It's not just to work you like a rented mule. <laughs> It's, there, there's an underlying strategy behind it all. Yes, you're building the kingdom of God. Yes, you're helping people to experience real life change. But you know what also is happening is you're getting something out of it. You're literally surrounding yourself with other God-fearing people, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are going to encourage you, hold you accountable, pray for you, lift you up. There's going to be a time when you're down. And when you're serving on the serve team, they're going to recognize that. And they're going to call you out on it and say, guess what? We love you. This isn't going to work. We're doing this together. So how can I pray for you? It happens every single week. That's what happens within the culture of serving within the local church. But that's just relationships. There's multiple ways that God might be trying to reposition you and prune you. The question is, do you hear him? Do you recognize it? Are you listening? And if so, are you embracing it? Because God wants you to grow. He wants you to be fruitful. And he wants people to see the fruit in your life so that they will know who Jesus is and so your life can be overflowing with the joy that only comes from the Lord. Let's pray today. Father, I'm so grateful. We are grateful that you want to have relationship with us. The creator of the universe, you want to know us in a real and intimate way. I pray, God, that there would be a hunger in our hearts as your people to want to remain, to settle and rest and camp out in you. I pray, God, that there would be this unquenchable obsession in our hearts to want to be with you continually, God. As we get up, as we go about our day, whether we're on our way to work or coming home from school, whatever it may be, God, that we would be obsessed with your presence, continually remaining in you, talking to you, thinking about you, listening to your word, reading your word, worshiping you, God, through song, whatever it looks like, God. I pray that this church, God, our online campus, those that are in this room, under the sound of my voice, God, that we would just literally be obsessed with your glory and your presence, that we would know you in a real and intimate way because the, the overflow of that relationship, of that remaining in you is that we will begin to bear fruit. Help us to be a fruitful people. 
We embrace today, God, the repositioning. We embrace today the pruning. Redirect us. Cut us back. Clip us. Whatever you need to do, God, to help us to be everything that you've called us to be. That our hearts would be overflowing with the joy of the Lord. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you know the first step to learning how to remain in Christ is, is initiating that real and life-changing relationship with Him as Lord of your life. And I would encourage you at this time, if you've not done that, this is the day of salvation. This is your moment. This is the time that God has appointed for you to say yes to Jesus as King on the throne of your heart. Whether you're joining us at our online campus or you're in the house today, my question is, do you know Jesus in a real way? Have you made heaven your home? It's only through him. Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Do you believe Jesus is the son of God? If you haven't, this is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity to say yes to life change. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in this room and you want to say that prayer with us as a church, would you just raise your hand in this place? right now, good and high, so I know who you are. We're going to be praying with you this week. Thank you. Last service, someone gave their life to Christ. If you're joining us online, just comment all in in the comment section below. We're going to pray this prayer together as a church family in support of those that have made this eternal life-changing decision. Let's pray. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart. Jesus is the Son of God. It's only through him I can be saved. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Reposition me today, God. Prune me. Help me to be all you want me to be. Help me to be fruitful and overflowing with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.